Welcome to Sabbath School Panel. I'm John Lomakang, and I am joined by an illustrious number of panel members that are part of our 3ABN family, and we'll introduce them to you in just a moment, or I will introduce them to you in just a moment. But thank you for following us every lesson as we continue on God's mission, my mission. Today we're talking about Esther and Mordecai, and we're going to break that down into five individual segments. But to my immediate left is the man who loves to sing every now and then, <laughs> singer in Israel and Bible student. Good to see you, Ryan Day. Thank you, Pastor. I have Monday's lesson entitled, In a Foreign Court. Wow. James Rafferty, right in the middle, donning the, the college sweater today. Mm, yes, the color of the season. I have Tuesday's lesson, Mordecai's Faithful Witness. And Jill, good to have you here as always. Thank you, Pastor John. On Wednesday, we look at, for such a time as this, seven lessons from Esther's stand. And all the way down there, Daniel Perrin, That's capping right. it off. The final lesson of the week on Thursday, the miracle of Purim. Okay, wow. Well, James, would you have our prayer for us this morning? Yes, Great. let's pray. Father, we're thankful this morning for the Bible, for the Word of God that comes to us directly from you, inspired by the Holy Spirit. We're thankful for Jesus, and we're thankful for the gift of salvation we have in Him, and we're thankful for this opportunity to remember Him and the great gift you've given to us, and also for each viewer. We ask that you'll work in our hearts and their hearts, draw us all to your heart. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to begin with our memory text, Isaiah 49, verse 6. And here's what the Word of God says to us today. Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Part of this is also repeated in Acts chapter 13, where Paul and Barnabas reminds the Jews of the call of God on their lives. You know, we're talking about cross-cultural ministry. Mm -hmm. And that can be found particularly in the story of Esther and Mordecai. And we go through the study and we realize that as the lesson writers put, a great deal has been written over the millennia about this book. And to this day, many Jews celebrate the Feast of Purim, which Daniel's going to talk about. And it's based on Esther chapter 9, verse 26 to 31. <clears throat> now, we're going to read about it, and then Daniel is going to break it down. Did I say Daniel? Yes, I mean Daniel. <laughs> you know, for whatever reason, Daniel, the prophet, is in my mind, and just somehow you're the prophet this morning. <laughs> but um, this is a very interesting study. When you think about it, how many of us <clears throat> are living in a place where we are challenged by our religious community. Mm. Or we may be living in a religious ghetto where everyone around us mm. believes the same thing except us. Mm. Or maybe we're in a situation where the laws of the land support one particular denomination and you are the odd person out. Mm. Well, that's kind of the situation with Esther and Mordecai, her uncle. They were living in the capital of the Persian Empire, Susa. And unlike the laws of the land, the Jews were not in what we might refer to as an ideal situation. And to make matters worse, they had a resident enemy by the name of Haman. And uh, that story is just an amazing story. Matter of fact, this is the book where you don't find the name God mentioned anywhere, but when you read it, you can find God everywhere. Mm. It's an amazing book. We find also in Esther chapter two, I'm going to go ahead and share this with you, but let's first start with Esther 9, verses 26 to 32, speaking about the days of Purim. So they called these days Purim, after the name Pura. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter, what they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them. That would fail, they should, that without fail, they should celebrate these two days every year. Mm. According to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, mm. every family, every province, and every city. That these days of Purim 
should not fail to be observed among the Jews and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. Mm. Then Queen Esther, verse 29, the daughter of Abihail, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews, to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus, with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them. And as they had decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning matters of their fasting and lamenting, so the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. And so you see this declaration, you find in the Jewish culture, many of their uh, generational observances are repeated even still to this very day, in spite of the fact that we know and believe that the ceremonial law was done away with at the time of the crucifixion of Christ, many of those ceremonies are still observed today by people that did not, in the Jewish community, did not accept Christ as the Messiah. And this is one of the decrees, and I'm looking forward to, now I'm not going to take away Daniel's thunder because I know he studied that, and he's going to talk about what that feast is all about. But we find also in Esther chapter 2 the incident of Esther becoming queen. Look at Esther chapter 2, verse 17. Uh, we find that um, there was some controversy between uh, Ahasuerus and his wife, and she would not do what he commanded her to do. So he away with her, so to speak, and sought someone that would take her place. And I think Ryan is going to talk about this, how this transition was something that was, we believe, orchestrated by the Lord because at the very outset, it was not known that Esther was a Jew. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave that up to you to explain mm -hmm. that in detail. But here we are in Esther chapter 2, verse 17. The Bible says, The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. The, prop, the, the preparation time was amazing. I mean, when they decided to, so, so to speak, in a pageant, narrow down the possible candidates to be queen, it was about a one-year preparation period. Uh, I could imagine what that was entailing, maybe how to walk before the king, proper etiquette before the king, uh, even preparation for perfume, perfumes and baths and different types of clothing and all the requirements in that very favorable position, Esther had to go through all of that before she appeared before King Ahasuerus. But in fact, she was a captive in a foreign country, which takes us now to Sunday. You know, it's never easy to be an expatriate in a foreign country. I had the chance to go and visit Dubai. And Dubai is a very Muslim country, but it's more of one of the relaxed cultures. However, evangelism from a Christian perspective is not allowed in Dubai. Christians could have their churches and do what they want within the borders of their churches, they're not even allowed to own the land on which their churches stand. Mm -hmm. But it was very interesting when I was there that for whatever reason, God gave favor to the Seventh-day Adventist church mm -hmm. and they were the only ones allowed to own their land in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And this was an amazing, uh, amazing, uh, amazing feat, amazing arrangement. But most of the people that attended that church were expatriates. They were not born in Dubai. A large contingency of Filipinos and, and Asians of different uh, categorizations, people from Africa, people from parts of Europe. And you could not find a local because it was almost uh, frowned upon for a Muslim to attend the Seventh-day Adventist church. However, they found a very creative way to minister there in Dubai. They held banquets at hotels, very neutral uh, places. I was invited to be a part of one of those. And they said, now we're going to have a, a banquet on, quote unquote, the Muslim New Year's Eve, which was different from ours. And it was held at a hotel. They said, we're going to have music. It's going to be a nice upscale dressed event. We want you to sing some love songs and then some Christian songs. And in that context, because they're coming as our guest, you can then share about Jesus. What an amazing experience that was to be in a country where evangelism is not allowed generally but if they come to the meeting, if they come to the hotel, 
you can tell them about Jesus. It felt so good to be able to share Christ with those who normally would not hear his name at all. And many of the people that are there, you can't hold a public meeting. You can't put tents out on the side of the curve or in any particular place. Your evangelism has to really be undercover. And so when we think about how God works in situations like this, how the Lord still finds ways to make it successful, let's look at some of the avenues that I pointed out. I have six very quick estimations that are significantly a part of that. Let's go to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. On one level, think how easy it would be if we were in a country where everybody believed the way we did. But notice, faithfulness to God is never the result of the laws of the land, but it is the condition of the heart. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. So if you're in a culture that doesn't support what you believe, your heart condition before God is more important than the laws of the land. Mm. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Can the laws take out your conditional uh, worship to God when it's in your heart? Absolutely not. You cannot get rid of someone's dedication to God when it stems from their heart. The other thing is morality. This is another thing cannot be legislated, but it is once again a point of declaration, a point of commitment between us and God. Look at Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. And this is how the Bible decrees any stance we take before our Lord and our maker. Paul the Apostle says, Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, or as the NIV says, your spiritual act of worship. Mm -hmm. And do not be conformed, let me use the phrase, to the society around you, yeah. but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So even in an adverse situation, God's will can be seen in your life, not because of what's happening around you, but because of what's happening within you. The fourth thing is Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19. Choice is the foundation on which we stand in a moral stance before God. Deuteronomy 30, 30 verse 19, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. And finally, Christ in us is the means by which righteousness is imparted, not by the law of the land. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Mm -hmm. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So in spite of being an expatriate, you can still be faithful to God. Mm. Amen. Mm. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor, for that great, great introduction. My name is Ryan Day. I have Monday's lesson entitled In a Foreign Court. And uh, we're actually going to be jumping into the first half or so of uh, of Esther chapter 2, where we see Esther and her uncle or cousin, I guess this would be her cousin, uh, Mordecai. And um, in this case, we're seeing that King Vashti, I guess that's how you would say her name, uh, in chapter 1, chapter 1 basically is focused on how that queen fell out of favor with the king. And of course, now he's going to replace her. Mm -hmm. And that's where Esther and her cousin uh, Mordecai comes in. So in that case, I'm going to start with Esther chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And uh, we'll read this. The Bible says, after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti and, she had, and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins in Shushan, the citadel into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai. And king, and the, it was, this was the king's eunuch, of course, the king over the, the, the particular household of the women. And it says cust custodian of the women. And let beautiful preparations be given them. Verse four, then let the young women who please the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king and he did so. In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordechai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimi, the son of Kish, the Benjamite, 
Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jehaniah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordechai had brought up Hadesha, I guess that's how you would say it, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So this is providing a little bit of history to set up the purpose of Monday's lesson because these were, you know, obviously Esther's history and her family uh, ancestry goes all the way back to Jerusalem. She's a Jew mm. and they find themselves uh, in the lineage of ancestry or people that came from Jerusalem that was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar and brought to Babylon. Now we're during the time of the reign of Persians, Babylon has fallen and they still find themselves as a people in a different country. Although she and her family had have now grown up in this particular culture. But nonetheless, they are still Jews. They are not Persians or they're not Babylonians. And so now we're going to see as you, as you begin to understand the rest of the story and how Haman comes into the picture and how he finds out uh, that, that this, this family or these people are Jews, it creates a major problem. But notice verse 8 and onward, and this is where the meat of the purpose of this lesson begins to develop. It says, So it was when the king's command and decree was heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel under the custody of Haggai, that, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young women pleased him and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Then seven choice maid servants were provided for her from the king's palace. And he moved her and her maid servants to the best place in the house of the women. So that's verses one through nine. And the lesson brings out here that it seems that Mordecai as a royal officer was sitting at the gate of the palace and was residing in the city of Shushan when his adopted daughter or cousin Esther, or with his adopted daughter and cousin Esther. Because of their position and living where they did, they were immersed in the Persian culture. This must be at least part of the reason Esther was chosen to be presented to the king. Esther also was taken and according to chapter 2, verse 8, uh, to the, into the king's palace, palace entrusted to Haggai, who had, charged, uh, who, who had charge of the harem. And so um, when you keep reading on to verse 10 and even on through to verse 20, now that she's in this position, Mordecai comes to her and says, look, you know, we are who we are. You've got to be careful about revealing who it is you are and where you're from uh, because this could prove to be problematic. Now he was exercising what would what we're soon going to find out was wisdom because obviously there were enemies in this culture, enemies in this city and in the royal palace that did not like Jews and because of Mordecai's stance, because he was a Jew, he worshiped the one true God and he refused to bow and make uh, basically provide reverence to uh, uh, Haman. Uh, Haman. Uh, this, of course, Haman doesn't like him. He hates what's, what's happening, that he's not giving him the, the praise and the worship and the honor and the homage that he thinks he deserves. And when he finds out that these people are Jews, of course, that sparks a whole major problem. So in Esther chapter 2, we're going to read verses 10 and 20. Notice what he tells Esther. And some people uh, would probably say, no, nah, bro, you know, don't hide who you really are. But yet there's wisdom being exercised here. He tells Esther in verse 10, he, Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. Now Esther had not revealed her family, and this is verse 20, now Esther had not revealed her family and her people just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. Now, the, the, the message goes on to say in the lesson, it says, though the text does not say precisely why, it's not hard to guess. As aliens in a foreign culture and religion that we will see could be hostile, they were wise in keeping silent about their family and people. Of course, we know this ends up working against them because she, obviously Haman does some investigation. He finds out who these people are. But I, I like the, in, the ending part of this lesson, and I just wanted to kind of set this up for the panel here just to change things up a little bit than usual. Uh, but the ending part of the lesson says, what circumstances might you think of where it could be prudent not to be overt or open about your faith? Or should we never do that? And if not, why not? So can you guys think of reasons why we might be open about our faith or in moments maybe where we should 
keep that on the down low. What do you think? Mm. Well, <laughs> if it means that the person you're trying to witness to will immediately shut you down or cut you mm -hmm. off if they know that your faith is something that they don't agree with. Mm -hmm. If you want to win their heart, I think it's wise to win their heart before you win their confidence. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You guys ever been in a situation like that? Mm -hmm. well, I'm just thinking of when it would endanger the continuing of the mission that God has asked you to perform. And I think about if you go to the Adventist Global Mission website, there's a group that it refers to called tent makers. You go in and you're not going you know, say what you are, you just interact and involve yourself with the society and community and uh, work your way in slowly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great, great, great point. I remember I was at New Jersey uh, recently doing a series and um, uh, in w we had the entire series at a neutral location. So it was not in a church at all. We elected to do the entire series at a neutral location. And so we advertised it for this location. And of course, within the first week, people start asking questions, you know, well, who's, who's sponsoring this event? Who's putting this on? And I've always uh, been of the uh, position that if people ask me directly, I'm not going to lie. I'll just tell them exactly mm -hmm. who I am and where I'm from and what my faith is and Amen. all that. That's and great. so not that I'm purposely trying to hide that, but um, in the opening weekend, I'll never forget it, that after the first week, there was a guy that, that had come out and afterwards he stayed and we talked for hours and he let me know at the end uh, of that conversation. He said, you know, um, he said, had I known that you were a Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath keeping Christian, uh, when I first walked in here, he said, I would have turned around and walked right out. Mm -hmm. He said, but now I can see that you're, you're a man of God. You've proven yourself. You've shown that you know the word and you've kept it Christ focused. And, and I'm glad that I stayed. I've learned a lot and I appreciate and I have a, you know, a higher level of respect for you and for your faith. And so that really spoke a lot. Mm -hmm. I've also been in other situations and this has always also kind of been a little bit of a, you know, a thing with me, uh, you know, as an evangelist early on, they tell you, you know, when you make your, your flyer, be sure on your flyer, if it's happening at the church, just put church auditorium and, and and that's always been a big thing for me so instead of church auditorium I always have them to put Adventist church and people have counseled me against this but I have had people to come to my series who have come for two weeks and then it comes that time where you transition from that neutral location to the church and then they find out your seventh day evidence and I've had people that have left even though they were enjoying the meeting they were learning so much they felt like we were pulling the wool over their eyes I've had mm. this happen on more than one occasion mm -hmm. the point of all of that is I'm not saying for it or against it at this point I'm simply remaining neutral and saying that there is a time similar to Ecclesiastes a time to speak a time to in a time to be silent a time to share and be wise to share when it's time and a time to be wise in not sharing and in this case because Esther and Haman they were practicing practicing wisdom to do this, I think it worked for them for a time until, of course, the devil came in through Haman and tried to mess everything up. But the point of the lesson is sometimes when we find ourselves in a foreign court or in a foreign situation, we must exercise wisdom and there's a time to speak and be open, but there's also times in which we must be careful in what we're sharing and what we're open about. Amen. Well, thank you, Ryan. Thank you even for that experience that you had mm -hmm. for us to share about. We're not done yet. We have three more days. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our 3ABN Sabbath School panel and the study on Esther and Mordecai. We're going to be going to James right now. Pastor James, it's your day. Tuesday's lesson is called Mordecai's Faithful Witness. You know, I still remember the first time I read the story of Mordecai and I thought, what a brave man. You know, such a dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of anger coming against him, standing up for God, standing up against local culture, standing alone, standing for principle. Are there Mordecais today? You know, Mordecais are needed today. So where are these modern Mordecais and Hamans? Are there modern Hamans today? You know, plotting against, uh, in an underhanded way, God's people and the principles for which they stand. So let's take a closer look at the story. I've been 
uh, given Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. We won't read all the verses, but let's just do a little bit of an overview here. As we look at Esther chapter 3, 1 through 15, we realize that Haman has been, he's been promoted. And because he's been promoted just under the king, all the servants of the king, verse 2, that are in the king's gate are to bow down before him, reverence him. This is the king's commandment. This isn't just something they do out of their own, you know, respect for Haman. They're commanded to do this according to the verse. And Mordecai does not bow or show him reverence. And the king's servants that are in the gate, verse 3, they have a question about this. They, they start asking Mordecai, why are you transgressing the king's commandment? Now, we're going to see a lot of parallels here between Mordecai and the book of Daniel because you have the same thing taking place in Daniel where Daniel and his friends are given a portion of the king's food and they're supposed to eat it. It's for, it's for their health. It's for their good. And they don't want to eat it. Everyone else is eating it, and there's some concern about, well, if you don't eat this, the king's going to have my head. There's some danger that's coming against you for not doing what the king commands. And we see the same thing here with Mordecai. Mordecai chapter uh, 3, verse 4, so it comes to pass as he daily refuses to bow, Haman is struggling with this, right? And so Mordecai tells them, you know, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. I, I don't do this. And Haman eventually, we're going to find Haman eventually is filled with so much wrath that he seeks to take Mordecai out. Not just Mordecai, but he takes out all of the Jews. He's seeking to take out all of the Jews. And so a lot of times what we do personally, our own personal convictions can uh, impact other people around us. And regardless of that, Mordecai still stays true to principle. You know, sometimes um, we might feel the pressure of acquiescing because if you keep doing this, it's going to hurt other people. Mm -hmm. But Mordecai resists even that pressure. Mordecai stands true to principle. What could cause him to stand true to principle? And what can give us the strength to stand true to principle mm -hmm. no matter what? So the quarterly goes on to say in Esther chapter 3, we learn that King as a Harris honored Haman, gave him a high position full of power. Everyone was told that they must bow down before Haman. But we read that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him homage. Verse 2, as we read, the Bible does not give us the reason why Mordecai did not kneel before this man. But we know that he is a faithful Jew. Mordecai is not willing to pay homage to a descendant of Agag, an Amalekite, mm. enemies of his people since the Exodus. De Deuteronomy 25, 19, how would a faithful Jew kneel before the Amalekites or for that matter, worship anyone but the Lord? Now, I don't think this really had anything to do with Haman's ethnic background, right? The three Hebrews refused to worship Nebuchadnezzar, who was a Babylonian. Uh, this was about principle. It wasn't about race. It wasn't about ethnicity or even politics. This was about the principle of God's law. And sometimes we can muddy the waters when we start mm -hmm. applying the principles yeah. of God's law to a political issue, right? Yes. Or a racial issue. There's a clear distinction. We've got to stay in the Word of God as Christians and follow the principles of God's Word and not let the waters be muddied. Because politics can change. It can go in one direction, then it can go in another direction. But God's principles never change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this reminds us that while we want to do all we can to meet people in their own culture, the quarterly goes on to say, we should never compromise the moral law of God to do so. Okay. Mordecai was in a foreign land with a foreign culture, but he refused to bow down before Haman because this would be a violation of the principles of life, the principles of God. Daniel and his friends I add that to the quarterly, are another example. Both of them in a time of captivity for God's people, both of them, that is Daniel and his friends and Mordecai, both of them servants in foreign lands, both of them refusing to compromise the principles of morality. Mm -hmm. So how do we see this today? You know, I, mm -hmm. I think of one example in our culture today, and I'm talking about American society, we have practices that violate God's laws even today. Mm -hmm. And it's culturally norm, and they may be normal. For example, abortion may be a normal thing, a legal thing, something that is accepted by the majority of our culture. But as followers of God, like Mordecai, we should not bow down to the pressures yes. of the culture if they violate the law of God. Mm -hmm. And, of course, abortion is a direct violation of the law of God that says, Thou shalt not 
kill. Very simple principle. Follow the principle. Don't muddy the waters with politics. So we look at the story of Mordecai. And we realize that this man is, in a sense, he's standing alone. And I appreciate that. That's brave. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. to stand alone is brave. Yeah. Where are the people who stand alone today for God, who stand alone for principle, even under the pressure maybe of their, their own people, right? Their, their church. The quarterly goes on to say, Then the king's servants who were within the gate said to Mordecai, Why you transgress the king's command? So here we have, again, this direct pressure from the servants that are there with Mordecai. They don't know in detail, we don't know, excuse me, in detail, the quarterly says how he responded, but the next text says that Mordecai told them he was a Jew. Surely in that response, Mordecai had opportunity to explain that as a worshiper of the God who created the heavens and the earth, he could not worship any sinful human being. Right? No doubt Mordecai was to some degree able to witness about his faith, a faith that he adhered to so strongly that it endangered him and unfortunately others. So this is the key and I think that when we struggle with some of these principles in relationship to culture, we need to remember why we're here. Mm -hmm. We're ambassadors for God. Amen. We are here to represent God. And of course, when we represent God, we represent His character and the character of God is a transcript of His law. We should, or we should say the law of God is a transcript of His character. When we're standing for the law of God, we're not standing for some moral code, you know, some, some uh, written out structural uh, truth that is right and good. We're standing for God's character. The law of God is a transcript of His character. So we're actually standing for the glory of God, for the principles of who God is, for the principles of love. So the quarterly goes on to say, from Daniel and his companions and Mordecai, a bright light shone amid the moral darkness, the moral darkness of the kingly courts of Babylon. And that's a statement that's taken from Ellen White Adventist Review, Sabbath Herald. Uh, May 13, 1884. In other words, we have confirmation here that Mordecai did the right thing. And that's what we need. You know, sometimes we struggle. You know, we're not sure if we're doing the right thing, standing for these principles, and there can be pressure coming from us, not just from society, but from the church, as we talked about. And yet we, we have this confirmation, and we need confirmation. So we as Seventh-day Adventists, we follow the Bible. The Bible is our guide. It's our foundation. But we also look to the lesser light, to the spirit of prophecy, to God's end-time prophet, to Ellen White, to kind of help us get over that hump sometimes to help confirm that we're going in the right direction because it can be difficult for us, especially when we see a lot of compromise taking place. Now, when Haman wanted, the quarterly goes on to say, when Haman wanted to destroy the Jewish people, his description of them was, there's a certain people dispersed among the peoples of all the province of your kingdom that keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of other people. They don't obey the king's laws. A people whose customs are different and who do not obey the king's laws, that's a perfect recipe for persecution. Mm -hmm. And again, we see these parallels. You know, Daniel chapter 3, violating the king's mandate. Daniel chapter 6, violating the king's law. Uh, Daniel chapter 1, you're not eating the king's provision, and you're going to look sickly, and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're not going to be as healthy as others. All of these laws, all of these mandates, all of these uh, cultural pressures coming against God's people in Daniel 1, in Daniel 3, in Daniel 6, and in... Uh, uh, Esther chapter 3, all of them are principles that God's people have faced and will face yes. at the very end of time. So we can expect a lot of these same principles to be in our society today. And we don't have to look for them in the future sometime, they're already upon us. Yes. The only way that we can be guided safely, the only way that we can go forward is we need to hear that voice. Uh, Isaiah 30 verse 21 says, You'll, we'll hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way walk ye in it, when we are tempted to turn to the left and we are tempted mm. to turn to the right. That's we good. need to let the Word of God be our guide, be our foundation, be that lamp unto our feet and that light unto our path. We need to stand on the light of the Word of God, that moon that the woman is pictured in Revelation chapter 12. Now I'm getting back into Revelation and getting all over the place, but we need to stay focused on the Word of God and let it be our guide. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Pastor James and Ryan and Pastor John. What an incredible study. The book of Esther is the great controversy. The book of Esther is an end time book in a sense with those applications you made to Daniel and Revelation and us today. Thank you for that. I'm Jill Morricone. On Wednesday, we look at for such a time as this. We're going to Esther chapter four, next chapter after Pastor James had. Esther chapter four. Now, 
today, I happen to be the only female on the panel with my brothers here. I think every little girl's thought of Esther, now this is just Jill's perspective, is that it's a fairy tale. Mm. It's a rags to riches story. The little girl meets the king, grows up to be a princess and a queen. Mm. But the truth of the story is not that at all. It's a raw story and a gritty story. She was brought to a harem. What little girl dreams mm -hmm. of that? Mm. She was married to a heathen king. What little girl dreams of being unequally yoked with someone else? She was made the queen, yes, but as Ryan brought out so clearly, she had to keep her religion, her identity, a secret. She was alone mm -hmm. in the palace. By the time we get to Esther 4, this is a time of national and religious crisis, as Pastor James set up so well. And God brought her there, as we discover in Esther chapter 4, for such a time as this. We're going to look at seven lessons from the stand of Esther from Esther chapter 4. But before we do that, I want to read you a quote from Daughters of God, pages 45 and 46. In ancient times, the Lord worked in a wonderful way through consecrated women who united in his work with men whom he had chosen to stand as his representatives. He used women to gain great and decisive victories. More than once, in times of emergency, he brought them to the front and worked through them for the salvation of many lives. Through Esther the queen, the Lord accomplished a mighty deliverance for his people. At a time when it seemed that no power could save them, Esther and the women associated with her, by fasting and prayer and prompt action, met the issue and brought salvation to their people. So what we discover here is that God calls men, God calls women to stand for him. So let's see what we learned, seven lessons from Esther stand. We're in Esther 4, we won't read it all. Verses 1 through 3 just says, Mordecai. And all the Jews were in mourning, sackcloth, and ashes mm. because of the decree that had come forth that they were all going to be killed at the end of the year. Mm. Now in verse 4, Esther finds out. Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Now we'll discover she's not distressed because of the edict, because she didn't know about it yet. She's distressed because she loved Mordecai. Mm. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he wouldn't accept them. Then Esther called Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her. And she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. Why is he in sackcloth? Mm. Why is he mourning? What is going on? Lesson number one, love for others must precede any stand for truth. Amen. Before she took that stand, why did she even take the stand? Mm -hmm. Well, she wouldn't have taken it if she hadn't known what was going on. And she wouldn't have even found out initially what was going on if she didn't love him mm -hmm. because he was in mourning, sackcloth and ashes. Isaiah 58 says, cry aloud and spare not. Does it not? But we cannot cry aloud and spare not unless we have love first mm, for God that's right. and love first for his people. Sometimes we cry aloud and spare not because of our own pride or because of our desire to be right or righteous or show other people their sins. Love for others must precede any stand for truth. Let's keep going. We're in verse 6. So Hatak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And the next couple of verses says that Mordecai says, this is what's going on. Haman promised a large sum of money to be given to the king's treasury. And also Mordecai provides the edict so that Esther can see what was written and what the decree is. Lesson number two, knowledge precedes any stand for truth. You can't act without knowledge. She had to understand the edict and the decree and understand what's really going on. Yet so many times we speak without any knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think of God speaking to Job in Job 38 verse 2. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we cry aloud and spare not and we don't even know the word. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we cry loud and spare not, and we don't even know the situation with another person. So first, we need love. Second, you need knowledge of the word and knowledge of the situation. Amen. Third, we're in Esther 4, verse 10. I think uh, 
No, that's coming next, sorry. Esther 4, verse 10. The verse is correct. Esther spoke to Hatak and gave him a command for Mordecai. And what does she say? She says, I can't go in before the king. How could I go in before the king unless I have been called? And I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. Mm -hmm. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Lesson number three, fear is a natural response to any call to stand for truth. She's afraid, is she not? I don't want to go in. I'm not called. It's against the law of the land. Well, I don't want to be killed. I'm not going. So I just want to tell you, sometimes we might be afraid to stand for truth. First of all, don't be hard on yourself. Recognize that it's a natural response to be afraid, but you don't have to be afraid. First John 4, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Yes, fear might be a natural response, but we don't have to be ruled by that fear and we can give it to God. Now we get to my favorite part. This is verse 13 and 14. This is the crux of the whole heart here. Mordecai, what's his answer? She's saying, I'm afraid, I'm not going. It's against the law, I'm not going before the king. Verse 13, Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Let's stop right there a moment. Lesson number four, God is not dependent on me in the stand for truth. Mm. We think he is. Oh, if I don't speak, if I don't, relief and deliverance will arise from another place. Mm -hmm. At 3BN, we say, nobody is indispensable. Mm -hmm. In other words, Lord forbid, I could be hit by a bus tonight. Mm. The truth would still go out. The message would still continue. 3BN would continue. Deliverance, God would rise up somebody else or any one of us. It's not dependent on us in some prideful way. God wants to use us, yes. But he is not necessarily dependent on us. When God raised up David because Saul turned away from him, God can use a donkey. Can we, he not? We learned that in Balaam. God could cause the rocks and stones to cry out. God is not dependent on us in the stand for truth. Mm -hmm. Lesson five, we continue in verse 14. What did it say? Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Lesson mm -hmm. five, God places people in certain positions to stand for truth. You've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is the heart of the book of Esther, in my opinion. It's the turning point in that great controversy drama. God placed Esther there. She didn't bring herself. It wasn't her who brought herself to that position at such a time as this. See, there's no room for pride. Oh yeah, I brought myself here. No, God placed her there. What position has God called you to fill? Where are you called to stand for truth? I believe God has called in a special way the ministry of 3ABN to stand for truth in these last days. Present the undiluted truth in the word of God, but not just the ministry of 3ABN, you at home. God has placed you in whatever position of influence you are in for such a time as this. Accept that call to stand for God. Going on verses 15 and 16, what does she say? She sends a reply to Mordecai and says, gather all the Jews together, fast and pray for me for three days and I and my maids will do likewise. I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mm. Lesson six, seek God with others before standing for truth. She didn't just say, okay, I'm gonna walk in before the king now. No, they spent time in prayer and fasting before they went in. Seek God with others before standing for truth. And finally, the final lesson is in verse 17. Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Before we saw that Esther did everything that Mordecai said. Now we see a reversal of power take place. Mm. Now he's listening to her. Lesson seven, when you stand for truth, other people will follow. Mm. So no matter what God is calling you to do today, make a stand and stand for truth. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, each one of you. You've set up the story now for Thursday's lesson. I'm Daniel Perrin. Thursday's lesson is entitled The Miracle of Purim. Now, most Christians don't mark Purim on their calendars, but there really would not be a, anything bad about doing that. It's a celebration of God's deliverance of those who have an extermination order marked out upon them. Uh, Purim is celebrated on the 14th day of Adar, the 12th month of the Hebrew religious calendar. Usually that falls in the realm of uh, February to March. And I know on the day of Purim that uh, Jewish communities will read through the entire book of Esther, 10 chapters and uh, celebrate God's deliverance and kids will, uh, whenever the name Haman is read, have these little shakers and noisemakers and will yell out and ah, all right, and it's a lot of fun even for kids. The lesson calls this the miracle of Purim, uh, but to think about Purim as a miracle surprises people sometimes because the name of God is not mentioned even once in the entire 10 chapters of the book of Esther, not even once, and maybe you already knew that, which is kind of surprising because you compare it with another post-exilic book, Ezra, 10 chapters, over a hundred times. Mm. You have the name of God being mentioned overtly in that book. And so some people say, miracle? God didn't, God wasn't even there. This is just a secular story of, of humans jostling for power and, and wit and, and wisdom and political conflicts. And, and we don't see a divine miracle, at least not in the way that we usually think of some sort of powerful thing happening. But uh, uh, all people see is, is that humans did this. Mordecai saw a threat. Uh, Esther went in before a queen. She made a request. She planned a banquet. Where's God here? And then people ask, where is God in my life? Mm -hmm. Today's text, Esther 9, 1 through 12, it just talks about people going out and doing what, uh, what they then had the ability to do to defend their lives. But I want you to know that right here on this Sabbath School panel set, even if they were to go out to a wide angle shot, you on, the, on this table here would not see any director. You wouldn't see a producer. You're not gonna see any camera operators. There it is, you, all right, they're, they're just not here. But I can guarantee you, they're here. I, I can see some of them right out here. Uh, and you wouldn't be able to see any of this uh, were it not for those people directing, producing, shooting these camera shots. And the same is true here in the book of Esther for those who are willing to see it. And the same is true in your life. When you're willing to see it, you're gonna find out that God was there orchestrating and working miracles all along. And you might not see them until retrospect and maybe the great retrospect of heaven. Wow wow, Jesus was true, and we know it's true. I am with you always. He was with me then, even though I did not see it in the moment. But when we look at this, at this story, here's what we see. The timing and the manner of Queen Vashti being deposed, the finding of her replacement, Esther being preferred and then exalted, Mordecai discovering the murderous plot, Ahasuerus' insomnia at just the right time when Haman is arriving in court. You can't make these things up. Uh, Mordecai and Esther's wisdom and restraint because all true wisdom comes from God. And Mordecai then being exalted into Haman's position of authority and the reversal of the decree, we see God's hand in all of these. In those texts that Jill just read, Esther 4 verse 14, if you remain silent, relief and deliverance will arise. And remember, Mordecai is communicating with Esther through couriers here, and they're not declaring their faith boldly necessarily. He believes in deliverance through a weaker vessel, something that looks weak. And he says, you've been brought to, you've come to, to this time for just such a time as this. He sees God's hand. And then Esther says, gather the people to fast. What were they doing? Just thinking about their health there? No, they're engaged in prayer, even if it's not mentioned. And then she says, I'm gonna go before the king. And if I perish, I perish. Mm. And you hear the echoes of Daniel 3, 17 and 18, when Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah say, we are not going to bow before that idol of the king, uh, placed there by the king. And they go before the king and say, our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, mm -hmm. we're going right. to do what is right. right. But I want to take you farther back to the big picture to see the miracle of Purim here. Um, back to Daniel chapter 9. Uh, Daniel 8 and chapter 9 are linked. Gabriel is coming, and I know there's a lot of details to throw in here really quickly, but Gabriel has given a message from God to Daniel, and he says, Know therefore, Daniel 9 verse 25, sorry, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 
until the Messiah, the Prince, all right, and then he gives a time prophecy here, linking Daniel 8 and 9 together, Daniel 9 leading to the Messiah, his ministry and his mission, Daniel 8 leading all the way through to uh, the, the closing scenes of Earth's history in that time prophecy to 1844 when the judgment hour begins where we live right now, and it all hinges upon the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Well, there had been a command to go back and begin re rebuilding the temple. Darius the Great had given a second command when the temple building had stalled to continue and finish the building of the temple. But it wasn't until 457 B.C. under Artaxerxes that that command, and we can read about it there in, under Ezra and Nehemiah's labor, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, the story of Esther happens under Xerxes, that's the historical name, Ahasuerus there in the Bible, who reigned from 486 to 465 BC. In other words, this happens before that command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Mm. And you have an enemy of the Messiah. Mm. says, I now have the time frame. God is going to carry out his time frame. And that enemy is going to do everything in his power mm -hmm. to cut that's off good. the starting point of this prophecy. Mm -hmm. We know that when Jesus was born, he then issued a decree to kill all the baby boys there in Bethlehem so that to cut off the Messiah before he could embark upon his ministry. Mm -hmm. And he does the same thing right here. If we can exterminate the Jews, there won't even be a remnant left to go back and this prophecy will never begin and I will be victorious. Mm -hmm. Do you not believe that in this book where God's name is not mentioned, He is there administering this prophecy, this prophetic timeline that He has said is sure, and it's going to go through. God is here in this spiritual battle, and that's what Esther is. It's an all-out spiritual battle. Can salvation go through? Mm. And in your life, when you don't see God working the way that you might expect, there is an all-out spiritual battle, and there are angels sent, dispatched to your side before the need is even uh, perceived by you, already working on your behalf. That's what's going on here. And so, what do they do? They establish a festival alongside the other religious festivals that happened every year. They call it Purim from the word poor, which means lots, casting lots. And they acknowledge we've laid all this in the hands of God. All right, and those lots about when should we then go and, and allow this, uh, uh, this defense of our lives. And so by not mentioning God, the book of Esther invites you to look into the details of your life. Look into the big picture. Look beyond the things that, that, that seem to be the stuff that you can see into the periphery and say, where is God leading in my life? Because God reveals himself in the things that we call normal life. Mm -hmm. For a Christian who has invited God into their life to dictate and direct, God does exactly that. He's present in our daily labors, and in our decisions. Those are things that we do and we've asked the Lord to be a part of them. The Christian life is not a series of eye-popping, jaw-dropping, heart-stopping, divine interventions. It is the process of asking for the Holy Spirit and listening for that voice and then us asking, uh, sorry, acting in obedience. Psalm 56, verse 12 and 13, very brief uh, jump into this chapter. At the beginning of the chapter, this is a, a psalm where David is praising God for deliverance when he was in, uh, in the city of Gath. And we know if we go back and we can read what he did, he pretended to be insane, let drool uh, slobber drip down his face, clawing on the walls, and then it looks like he delivered himself. But then he says this, I will render praises to you, for you delivered my soul from death. The miracle of Purim was God's miracle worked through people. Mm -hmm. I can tell you there's ministries like this one who they step out in faith and there is a need for finances they don't have. And what happens? A person uh, who followed the impression of God upon their heart and there is an envelope in the mail with a check covering something. That's happened time and again throughout history. Did God do it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Worked through people and he's going to work through you to be a ministry in the life of somebody else. We pray for the Holy Spirit and just because we don't feel a tingling sensation and have a tongue of fire come down on our heads doesn't mean God has not kept his promise. That's the right. Holy Spirit is given, that's prompting right. us to action and when we act, that's God's miracle working through our willing obedience. Amen. And so in the moment of trial, you may not sense God, but I challenge you, and here's the challenge for today. Go back through your day, every day, and say, Lord, show me where you were instrumental mm -hmm. in leading me. 
because there are people all around you who say, where's God? And you are the one placed in their path to say, let me show you where God is. Let me show you the way he's moved in my life that you may not have noticed and you inspire other people to see how God has moved in their lives. And that's the miracle of Purim. God works through people and we share that with others so they can see God work in their lives too. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Praise Thank you, Lord. James. Thank you, Ryan. Give me your closing thoughts. Amen. You know, I, my, my lesson had me to go back and reflect on Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I'm not going to read all of it, but right here in verse 6 and 7, it says there's a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. And of course, all of this is under the banner of to everything, verse 1 in Ecclesiastes 3, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. May we fall within the will of God and make sure that we're exercising wisdom when we have interaction and in our missions to one another. Amen, amen. I was thinking about 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. And so we need the Spirit of the Lord to guide us. And we can recognize that guidance when we see that principle of liberty in our lives and in our, the lives of others. Amen. As we look at Esther 4, we think about Esther's stand. And sometimes when God calls us to make a stand, it might even cost us life. But it's important to know that we make the stand because God is with us. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you're one of those people who has already spent time writing down the way that God has revealed himself in your life, go back and review that and remind yourself. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you, you'll be amazed when your faith is enriched and you say, oh, yes, God was there. God is here, even when I don't see it right now. Thank you, everyone, for this lesson. You know, we talk about God's mission, my mission, how wonderful God's mission was worked out through the life of Esther and Mordecai. And God wants to do the very same thing to you. We don't serve God because it's convenient, mm -hmm. because it's easy, because it's popular, mm -hmm. because it's legislated, because everyone else around us is doing it. We do it because God is working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We're about to wind up our entire series of God's mission, my mission. The next lesson, number 13, the end of God's mission. But don't forget, say what Peter and John said when they were faced with determination. We ought to obey God rather than man. See you next time.